Well, here we are with our Sunday School lesson for Sunday, April the 3rd. And it is the fifth Sunday of Lent. And I wanted to share something with you before I actually got started on the lesson today. As you know, I've been doing these lessons for quite a while, starting in March of 2020. So we just passed our two-year anniversary. And, and as you, you do anything for an extended period of time, you, you get into a routine. And my routine has been very simple in that I get up, typically, and I've shared this many times, 5 o'clock in the morning, that's my quiet time with the Lord. And I, I begin to prepare Sunday school lesson for that week. I, I read other resources, and it's just, it's a special time for me, and it's become part of my routine. And then on Friday, I typically record the lesson. I either do it early Friday morning or later on in the afternoon. I do it from my office. And so there's, as you can imagine, there's a lot of activity and people start scurrying around and coming to the office and in and out, office next door and in the parking lot. And so I try to do it before that starts on Friday morning or I wait until everybody leaves in the afternoon. Well, yesterday, and this is Saturday morning that I'm now recording this lesson, yesterday was an exception. And the exception was that when I looked at this lesson and I started spending time on it, I realized that it was absolutely probably the most difficult chapter in all of the Bible to understand. And I struggled. I struggled with, with, with how best to present it. And I had different thoughts, I had different ideas, and, and I let Jonathan, one of our senior pastors, know last night that I wouldn't be getting the lesson to him yesterday on, on late Friday, but it would be Saturday because I was struggling with it. And he shared a couple of ideas with me and, 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 it, and it really did give me a little bit uh, more direction on how I wanted to, to share this lesson. But that brings up a point. And, and the point is when you struggle with, with something, when you struggle with a passage, when you struggle with a concept, when somebody says something to you and you think, I don't know about that, don't hesitate to use the resources you have available. And, and one of those resources is our ministers. And, and they welcome the opportunity to share ideas. And, and don't be afraid to do that. I think sometimes I look back over my life and, and, and there's certain people in your life who think, I don't want to embarrass myself. I don't want them to think I don't really understand. But I do that all the time. I love to engage in dialogue, even though it may be something that we don't have 100% agreement on. The fact that we can share as adults, and I say this all the time, that the Bible is such an adult book. There's so much here. But as we absorb what's here and as we share with other people and as we listen to other ideas, we grow in our faith. And it strengthens our faith. And so I would encourage you to do that. But what was so difficult, and our, so our lesson today comes from Mark 13. The, the uh, title of the lesson is Right on Time. And the purpose statement is to remain alert and vigilant in times of waiting and to trust in God at all times. Now, why is this so difficult? Why was this particular chapter 13, why is that so hard to understand? And a lot of it is the fact that when Jesus is teaching, when Jesus is sharing, keep in mind, first of all, that this is the last week of his life. We talked about that last week. It's the last week of his life on earth. And, and he did. The triumphal entry has occurred, the donkey has been borrowed, the, the, the palm leaves have been waved, he's wept over Israel, he's, he's, as we talked last week, he's thrown the, the money changers out of the temple. And so he's down to the last few days as he looks toward the cross. And, and one of the things that, that I think about as I think about this lesson is what did he want to impart on the disciples. What did he want to share with the disciples that was important? What did he want to leave them with? He was leaving his work to them. And what did he want them to know? What subjects did he want to clarify with them? They've been together for three years. But what did he want to just one more time emphasize? What motivation? What encouragement? What would be the most important things that they needed to remember? And, and one of the things that, that some Christians spend a lot of time on, they dwell on, and sometimes the Christians, we don't talk about it at all, it is the doctrine that Christ will come again. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. The, the, we, we talk about that when we take communion. 
we declare the mystery of faith that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Now we spend a lot of emphasis on the resurrection. We're going to be celebrating the resurrection. We're going to be celebrating Easter in the next couple of weeks. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about the second coming. And yet it's a, it's a very important doctrine to our faith. Some Christians just look at it as something optional. We really don't want to talk about it. It's not as important as other topics. Now, to be fair, there are also people that dwell on it. They focus on it. They spend time trying to figure out when it's going to happen. We're going to talk about that a little bit here in a few minutes also. And yet, biblical prophecy provides some of the greatest encouragement and hope that we have available to us today. The Old Testament is saturated with all kinds of prophecies, which include the second coming of Christ. One scholar that, that I was referred to said that there were 1,845 references to Christ's second coming in the Old Testament. 17 books give it prominence. In the 260 chapters of the New Testament, there are 318 references to the second coming of Christ. 23 of the 27 New Testament books refer to this great event. So there's a lot of emphasis on it, yet we don't really spend a lot of time. And part of the reason is it's, it can be disturbing the way it's presented by some people. And so here we are today to give you some context before we actually look at the passage. Jesus is now back in the temple, and he's just finished some tough teaching. And as the temple service was completed, Jesus positioned himself and watched the offering boxes. And there he saw a widow giving all that she had, while others just gave for show. He taught another lesson to his followers about commitment. Now the service has ended, and the crowd's been dispersed, and Jesus and his disciples prepare to leave. And so that's where we pick up our lesson today. As Jesus left the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what awesome stones and buildings. And Jesus responded, Do you see these enormous buildings? Not even one stone will be left upon another. All will be demolished. Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple. Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will all these things happen? What sign will show that all these things are about to come to an end? Jesus said, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many people will come in my name saying, I'm the one. They will deceive many people. When you hear of wars and reports of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must happen. But this isn't the end yet. Nations and kingdoms will fight against each other. And there will be earthquakes and famines in all sorts of places. These things are just the beginning of the sufferings associated with the end. So, think about this. And I, and I love passages like this because when I think about the apostles walking out of the temple after the service, they're talking to Jesus, and one of them says, Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful temple? And I think about us. I think that's something we would say. How many times have you been to something? Have you been, been to a building and you've seen it and you said, that is just the most remarkable building. I can remember Big Ben in London. When I saw Big Ben for the first time, despite all the pictures, I thought, wow, that's impressive. I looked at Judy and I said, just look at that. Now, she was standing there looking at it, but I wanted to point it out. You go to a show and you leave the show and you're both sitting there, but you, you look and say, wasn't that incredible? I mean, did, did, that was just absolutely amazing. We do that. We're human. The, the Bible is human. It's stories. They're real stories. And so, as he was doing that, and, and, and he told them, he said, you know, this temple is not going to stand. The temple, which was the, the crown jewel of Israel, it was a temple that was rebuilt after it had been attacked. Josephus, who was a, a historian that wrote during this period of time, he said the marble used to build the temple, to resurface the temple, was white with green specks. He said there was beautiful artwork that was sculptured in the beautiful stones. And so here we are in a period of time, and it's what's so difficult for us to appreciate or to understand, when the Jewish people longed to be free from Roman control. And the temple represented this hope of Israel's glory. And every Jew understood it. 
And so one of the disciples said, look at this beautiful temple. This is our hope. And Jesus said, it's going to be destroyed. He said the temple's going to be destroyed by the Romans, and in fact, in A.D. 70, it was destroyed, the ground was plowed, and all remnants of the temple were taken away. And then he says, see that no one leads you astray. Jesus was concerned. He warned them. He wanted, warned us for us not to misunderstand his teachings, to listen to what he said. Don't listen to other people. Listen to him. And not to let anyone mislead us. And that's an important topic. It's an important thing for us to understand. Barclay, in his commentary, points out that the Jews never doubted they were God's chosen people. And therefore, they knew that in time they would occupy the place deserved for God's chosen. But it would only be when God intervened. And Jesus said, but many will come in my name and say that I am he. There's going to be false teachings. We've seen that. We've seen it. We've seen it on a, on a national level. We've seen it. We've, we've heard stories about David Koresh. What a horrible thing that was when all of those people were killed. Jim Jones, who led all of those people to their death because they believed in him. Warren Jeffs, now serving in prison for his life and, 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 and the way he destroyed other lives. And, and Jesus tells us that we're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, but not to be alarmed. They must take place, but that doesn't mean that the end is yet here. When we think of wars, we think of World War I, we think of the Civil War, we think of World War II, we think of Korea, we think of Desert Storm. Today we're concerned about Ukraine and what Russia is doing there. But the Greek word, the translation from Greek, and what I think Jesus was really saying to us was that war is much more than that. Because war translated, it, it implies this conflict or a group of people in conflict with one another. And when we think of it that way, we have to think about all that's going on in our, our country, our world, in our cities. I, I'm in the real estate business, and, and, and we're constantly hearing from people who are, are wanting to move, wanting to move here because into the, the, the Charlotte area, into North Carolina certainly because they feel like it's a better environment to raise their families. It's going to be a safer environment, and yet we have major issues in, in Charlotte, in Mecklenburg County. And, and, and I can't remember, I had a conversation this week, I can't remember a time in my lifetime where I've seen so many people so angry. I, I say I had a conversation this week with a couple of people. And we were talking about that, I said, what is going to have to happen? For that anger to be taken away, we're seeing people strike out at each other. We're, we're, we're seeing people, it's not just frustration, they're angry. And they're treating each other in ways that they shouldn't be treated. And it has to end. We are in conflict with each other. But knowing all of that, knowing and seeing that, doesn't mean that the day of grace is over. And it's important to understand that. And so we go on and, and the, our lesson ends with the <clears throat> passage in 1325. And he says, learn this parable from the fig tree. After its branch becomes tender and it sprouts new leaves, you will know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, you know that he's near at the door. I assure you that this generation won't pass away until all things happen. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will certainly not pass away. But nobody knows when that day or hour will come, not the angels in heaven and not the Son. Only the Father knows. Watch out, stay alert. You don't know when the time is coming. It is as if someone took a trip, left the household behind, and put the servants in charge, giving each one a job to do and told the doorkeeper to stay alert. Therefore, stay alert. You don't know when the head of the household will come and whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows in the early morning or at daybreak. Don't let him show up when you weren't expecting and find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, stay alert. He's saying that, that what's going to happen to the temple is going to happen to the temple. He's saying that, that he will return. 
He's saying that he will come back at any time. He says, watch, notice, anticipate. But you will never know for sure. No one will know. Be on guard. Keep away. Stay awake. The Master is coming. And he even repeated, stay awake. Jesus' instructions for us are not so that we can know or be informed, but it's so we will be ready. I, I, when I talk, and I've got friends, and they dwell on this, they dwell on the second coming. They're worried about the second coming. They're trying to anticipate when the second coming. There's certainly people that in media that we read about, and, and they feel like their job is to predict when the second coming is going. The second coming will happen. And to say that as we read this passage that Jesus is saying that these things are going to happen within his generation or our generation is in error. But for Jesus, he says no one will know. Not the angels, not even he will know. And so isn't that a bit of heresy on our part when we think that we've got the right to know? He said, I don't know the day or the hour that I will come again. But he, draw, he draws a practical conclusion and explanation. He said, we're like men who know that their master will come, but we just don't know when. And we, we live in this shadow. We don't need to be fearful. We don't need to be hysterical. It means that day by day our work must be completed. It means that we must live so that it doesn't matter when he comes. It gives us the great task of making every day fit for him to see and being at any moment ready to meet him face to face. All of life becomes a preparation to meet the king. And it tells us that only God can see into the future. It tells us that, that we, we shouldn't worry. It tells us that to speculate is useless. It tells us to immerse ourselves in our daily lives. I think about it, and I've been thinking about it a lot as I prepared this lesson. It's a good thing that we don't know the future. Now you might say, well, gee, I wish I knew the future. I want to know the future. But when I think about that, do I really want to know the future? I want to, I want to prepare. I, 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 I know that if, if I live on this earth long enough, there are certain things that I need to do. There are certain things that you, know, you want to be comfortable financially. You would like to be able to, to see you know, what your, your grandchildren become. You would like to see them uh, you know, have, have good lives, you know, find a spouse, all of those things. But yet, isn't it good that we don't really know? Isn't it good that it's all in God's hands? And, and I, I want you to think about something. It's not necessarily a pleasant thought. But I want you to think about it. If you knew right now, if you knew this very minute as you're listening to these words that at 4.17 tomorrow afternoon, at 4.17 tomorrow afternoon, you would take your last breath. If you knew that, what would today be like for you? What would tonight be like for you? If you knew that 4.17 tomorrow was over, we don't know. But if we did, how would you live your life differently today? What would you do differently? And I think that's what this passage is telling us. Would you, is there somebody you'd call up to, to say, hey, I, you know, we, we got into an argument a while ago and it's been weighing on me and I just would like to clear the air on that. Would, would, or, or better yet, would you, would you, is there somebody you'd call up and say, you know, I just want you to know what an influence, what a positive influence, what a great friend you've been. How important you have been in my life. I want you to know that, that, that I'm a different person today because, because of our friendship. Because when I had difficult times, you were there with me. How would you treat people just different that you don't even know? How would you treat people, the, the person at the, at the restaurant that's waiting on your table that, you, that you're irritated with because they didn't bring your, your food as quickly as you thought they should? How would you treat them? How would you treat that clerk at the store who was, was working and there's a big long checkout line and they've been working for hours and haven't had a break and, and they finally get to you and they don't check you out as quickly as you think they should? 
how would you be different? What would you say differently? How would you act differently if you knew today that tomorrow at 417 it was over? I think you know the answer to that question. And wouldn't it be interesting if we lived our lives that way? Because that's what Jesus is telling us to do. We don't know. We can't know. Only God knows. I've shared this with you before and, and, and on the wall of, of Judy's parents' home in her bathroom was a cross stitch that Nadine had done. And, and that cross stitch, I have it hanging in my office. And, and I have a, a small version of it in my closet at home where I get dressed in the morning because it's something I look at every day. The cross stitch says, this is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or use it for good. What I do today is important because I'm exchanging a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, this day will be gone forever, leaving in its place something I traded for it. I want it to be gain, not loss. I want it to be good, not evil. Success, not failure. In order that I shall not regret the price I paid for it. Will you pray with me, my friends? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for today. We give you thanks for these words. We give you thanks for this reminder, this thanks, this reminder that you have, have given to us as you were, you were headed to the cross. We just, we just give you thanks. We ask as we go throughout today and tomorrow and this week that you keep our eyes open to the things that you want us to see, our ears open to the things that you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing with that love that you have put in each and every one of us. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you, my friends, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.